everyone. Welcome to episode 20 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm glad you could join us tonight. Uh, thank you to everyone that joins us live. I know a lot of people watch this uh, program later. It is uh, basically recorded live on Facebook, so everything is live. So when people start commenting, uh, it's pretty cool because I can comment back to it and uh, so that keeps the show pretty fresh but if you can't watch it right now that's fine you can always uh, tune in on the POA history group and uh, if you're not a member join or if you know somebody that wants to join like tonight's topic the POA the history of the POAC internet national sale there will be a lot of people involved in that topic so there might be people that want to watch this because family members or they owned uh, POAs that were in the sale or uh, POAs that were uh, sired or produced by different ones that were in the sale so uh, we have a very special guest tonight for episode 20 and it is uh, a renowned auctioneer Doug Sorrell from Miamisburg uh, Ohio Doug uh, did the sale for over 25 years at the national level. He also did uh, many regional sales, and he'll tell his story of how he became a POA uh, an auctioneer, and he did a great job. He's in the POAC Hall of Fame, so if that tells you anything, uh, he went in the Hall of Fame for his work and contribution with the international sale. So before we get started, we do have a lot of material tonight. 1957 was the first sale, so the breed was still in its infancy, which it started in 54, so it was really young. Uh, but this sale is still going on today. Unfortunately, last year it was canceled, first time ever. Uh, COVID was the main reason for that. Uh, there is a lot of factors that have kind of hurt the sale over the years. Of course, what we're doing tonight, the Internet, things like that. You can sell uh, horses over the Internet, over the cell phone, take a picture and, you know, wire money just like that. Bang. So but there is other breed sales and a lot of horse barns that are still out there and some famous sales that are uh, still going today. So. Uh, so we're going to get to that a little bit. But uh, Tracy Keene's one of my biggest uh, contributors she's on here can you see me yes i can see you uh then there's a couple other people i can't tell who you are because you didn't join the ecam thing but thank you for everybody for commenting so far so what i'd like to get across tonight the main reason we're doing this topic tonight is because people in poas we need your help the poac need your help if you've been thinking about selling a poa i know there's some easy options but sometimes it's not that easy either online of course advertising's kind of going down publications and st stuff but uh, the international sale is really it really helps keep driving the poac you know our main events like the national show the congress now which they just had in tulsa and then the sale when it gets 100 to 200 consignments and you can do the math just times the consignments and then the commission that's what really drives paying the bills and helping support to keep the club alive uh, so we really need to keep the sale going and uh, tonight's show is dedicated to that if we could get 10 poas consigned to the sale to do, because of tonight's show i would be so happy i would consider that a sponsorship i hope other people would be happy too but if if people watching would tell friends and tell people i mean if you had five or six colts born this year foals you should take one to gordyville illinois in september uh, and consign it so you can look up on poac.org or contact somebody on poa owners or somewhere contact one of your regional directors and find out how to consign a poa it's really easy uh, they'll help you out so uh, like tracy just said they currently shoot for 40 head so i know we don't have the huge breeders anymore you know lynn puffenberger used to consign five or six and you had uh, gene carr consigned a whole bunch and people like that you know steels over the years did they didn't as much towards the end but they did early on yeah ray Peets. i mean you had a lot of breeders that would consign four or five every year i know damons are thinking about consigning some so that would be good but another thing i kind of want to reach out some of these people may not be watching but some of the people that stable their poas at uh, trainers and stables if you've been trying to sell one don't be afraid to consign it to the sale because we're going to talk tonight there's been some good poas bring good money so uh 10,000 and above for a really good poa but if it's not there 
It's like playing the lottery. If you don't buy a ticket, you don't have a chance to win. You can't get twenty, twenty-five thousand for your POA if it's not at the sale. You know, you don't, you might get it, but you ain't gonna get it at the sale. So just try to bring it and just think of what you're supporting for the club. So with that said, I'll get off the little promotion there. Just please help spread the word. It's getting crunch time for the deadline. I know uh, it's probably a soft deadline now, but if the club could get 40 POAs consigned, that would be probably good enough to have a sale. They used to have over 200. I was on the committee for years and years. We'd have 200 to 250 consigned, and we'd have to have a screening meeting every year in either Iowa or Indianapolis to consider what you know, if we had to cut some because it was just so many to have in a two-day sale. So we'd usually screen out 20 or 30. Some would be because the paperwork was wrong or, you know, the pictures didn't look good or whatever. And uh, we, so we would screen some to try to get down to 200. And how times have changed now, we're trying to get up to 40. So uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, Tracy says we're also doing something with a new provider you can post ponies videos before the sale. Yep, so keep that in mind too. We're gonna have the internet for the sale, uh, so that will help uh, advertise your pony too, and the, the day of the sale, it should be a, a live, uh, live on the internet, so. Okay, so with that said, let's give a little, whew, okay. So, we're gonna talk about the history of the POA sale. So you might wonder why this list is up here since we're talking about the sale, but Dean Damon actually asked about this. Somebody asked about Hall of Fame POAs that went through the sale, and then he said, what about the top 20 sires? So those highlighted in yellow have all been consigned to the international sale. Uh, now don't look at the numbers there, that's, uh, that's from 2020, I haven't updated it for 21 yet, and those are just the halter numbers of sires, that's not their total. So, but the ranking is correct as of 2020 after that show so the silver kid was sold as a yearling by his breeder dean or uh, Corey damon kiddo tough was consigned when he was about six or seven paper tigers ran through the sale a couple times i'm a silver royal again another damon brad poa was uh, purchased as a baby or yearling salty three bars was in the sale a couple times uh, lynn Puffenbarger consigned him, and uh, Kurt and Judy Phillips from Ohio purchased him, and then they consigned him back a few years later, and Len purchased him back. Hive Avatar, of course, we'll be talking to him about him tonight. He broke the record in 1989. That was a famous sale. J.K. Supreme Scooter sold in 2000 or 1994 as a baby in Tulsa, the last sale that was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then uh, Series Silver Prince sold in Iowa in the late 70s. And of course, Doc's Rough and Tough sold in 1989 as a weanling, uh, consigned by Doc and uh, purchased by the Damon family. So Damon's are all over this list, but, uh, and it's rightfully so, they're gonna probably consign some again this year. So they've been a benefit of selling at the sale and purchasing at the sale. So here we go, we can tell we're dealing with history. Let's put the little history tag up there. This was in 1957. This was the first high selling POA at the very first sale. He brought a whopping $1,600, which in 1957 was quite a bit. And if anybody can tell me his name, you're smarter than me because he was unregistered. He was an unregistered yearling. So he just basically sold, you know, and they registered him later. Uh, he was consigned by this gentleman that's on the left and then he was purchased by the gentleman on the right. So J.W. Uh, Linging from Salem, Kentucky, and then he was purchased by Harry Johnson from Red Oak, Iowa. And of course, the man in the middle is the person that created POAs, and that is uh, Les Boomhauer from Mason City, Iowa. So that's a cool historic picture there from the very first POA sale that was held in uh, Mason City, Iowa, and 1957. So here's one of the early POAs that was purchased. He was consigned as Wampum, and the man uh, that had uh, Pow Wow Pony Farm named him Apache Wampum, and uh, he became the 55th registered POA. There wasn't a lot of registered POAs at the time. They, they allowed mares, uh, Shetland mares and pony mares, Welsh mares, any 
any solid mare bred to a stallion they can sign back then and we've kind of come full circle because now we're doing that again with horse mares that are bred to POA stallions. So here's one of the famous auctioneers early on, Johnny Woods from St. Joseph, Missouri, auctioned off quite a few POA sales in the early days. Here they're advertising 150 head. This probably would have been in about 59 or so. Uh, there's a couple other auctioneers there from Iowa and Minnesota. Uh, for a long time, they used three auctioneers, and then they went to two for a while. And then, of course, uh, Doug Sorrell, when he started, he, uh, he had a partner for the first two years, and then for 20-some years, he did it all by himself. So here's uh, the breed promotion sale. This is uh, 1960, outstanding 1960 sales. So you see... Uh, Hans Tawanas topped the sale at 2,500. Starfire was a famous uh, early POA mare. And then Corette's Tomahawk, and that's uh, Bob Corette down there. So you've seen uh, Boomhauer's dream was kind of coming true. That was the, let's see, fourth sale, 57, 8, 9. Yep, the fourth sale, and you had Nebraska, Florida, and Oklahoma, some of the top sellers were going to. And you can kind of see there the averages on this page. And I have uh, the top five averages written down for probably 30 some years and then the average written down. So as you're looking at this page, I'll just kind of go to my notes here and talk about in 1957, the POA uh, 51 sold in the sale and they were buyers from eight different states and the average was $331. In 1958, the average went up to 463 and then it went up to 470. By 1960, that's why they're talking about outstanding 60 sale. It was $553 average because the high seller was 2,500. The high seller before that had been 2,150. And the year before in 59, the high seller had only been 1,300. So 60 was a banner year for the young sale. It was only the fourth year. Then the prices started dropping again. And of course, we'd need a I'm a POA historian, but we'd need an economist or a, a his, U.S. historian in here to see what the economy was doing during these years, because we all know that's important. Just like the late 70s, early 80s with the oil boom and the oil shortage from the early 70s, and then all of a sudden, you know, you picked up a quarter horse journal in the early 80s, there was 200 sons of impressive standing at stay, and everybody had a little horse place or was hauling their mares to huge horse ranches and the POAs was blooming like that too and then all of a sudden the boom hit like 84 or so and the prices dipped and POAs was the same way so you can kind of see the ebb and flow of these lists so uh, but 60 like I say that was the highest for a while then it dipped down to the 300s and 400s all the way until 1974 the average wouldn't go back to 503 in 1974 and the high seller was only 1900 that year. But as the 70s would start, the prices would start going back up again, and of course the high sellers would go back up. But just the POA blood in general, they started putting more Prince Plodit breeding, Appaloosa breeding, and of course a lot of quarter horse breeding, and uh, sons and grandsons of three bars started be used, to be used, even with the 54 inch uh, limit. So the quality was going up, and the prices were going up. So here's an early POA that was consigned. She was actually consigned to the Boomhauer Barrett sale in 63 that spring or in February when Black Hand sold for so much money and she didn't sell there. So the two partners consigned her to the 63 POA international sale. And there's a funny story, I've maybe told this before, but uh, the late George Bishop would tell this story a lot better, but they, they were from Utah, the Bishops. He was a great promoter. He had bear paw too, and then of course later he was the breeder of barkeeper and uh, salty three bars and POAs like that and all the St. Nick's, most of the St. Nick's he was the breeder of. So he wanted this mare for his family, for his grandkids, and uh, he was an oil man, uh, George was. So he couldn't make it to the sale, so he contacted one of his friends from Utah and uh, told him how much he wanted to bid on this filly. Well, right before the sale, the friend called and said they weren't going to make the trip. So George made, made arrangements and told another POA that they were really interested in this filly and what price to go to. Well, unbeknownst to George, both people attended the sale, 
and he paid exactly what he wanted to pay for the filly. They bid against each other, both for George, and I can't remember the price, but she became a lifelong member of uh, West Bonneville, Utah, with the Bishop family, and that was an own daughter of Black Hand, uh, Hands EU. So that's a cool story there. Now I want you to look at this picture. I've shown this picture before, but this is a Lynn, young Lynn Puffenbarger, and uh, this would have been from the early 60s with a grand champion mare. I know she doesn't look like much compared to now standards, but she at today's standards, but she was stocky. But just remember that name because we're going to circle back to this later in the show. Uh, right before we bring Doug on, we'll be talking about this mare again uh, in, from the 1983 sale. So Skaggs, Cherokee, Fox's Princess. Just remember this. She sold for $1,000 way back then, uh, and that's Lynn showing her to Grand at the national show. Here's a famous POA that went through the sale, 4J Leopard Boy. You'll see a lot of stallions went through the sale. Of course, a lot of families showed stallions more than they do now back then. A lot of supreme champion gildings, mares, and stallions were consigned to the sale. And we're also going to show a lot of young stock that later became famous. Some of them sold pretty cheap. Some sold and broke records. But this was 4J Leopard Boy. Of course, he was the sire to 4E Leopard Queen uh, that the Denny's had. Another famous POA, Kootenai's Wee Willie. He's a chapter in my book, Spots Included. He was sold to Dr. Armstrong to, from Michigan, so he went from Utah to Michigan. This is Tomahawk's Big Creek. This is when the Murfeld group sold him, Murfeld family. They broke the record in the early 60s by purchasing him from another great POA breeder, John Ludwig from Pennsylvania, and then they sold him in 67 to uh, Lutke and Slagles. And the Slagle family, of course, went on to breed a lot of great POAs, including Hive Avatar, who would again set a record at the POA sale in 1989. We'll get to that in a while. So here's a famous foal by Tom Ox Big Creek, and she sold for $2,100 in 1967. This is GR's Big Creek's Dandy. And of course, it's written there, I like these notes. This is uh, Lammers Botter. I know Mark Lammers watches this show. Uh, his family raised a lot of great POAs in Nebraska, most of them with the Lammers prefix. And they had this uh, filly. She was way ahead of her time, a 1966 filly. She's pictured there as a yearling. Of course, she lent her name to Doug Murfeld's famous stay in MP's Big Creek's Jim Dandy was the full brother. He was born the next year. Here's another early day POA born in 59. Polka dots dip or pip. I mean, she was in the sale, golden rods, the stone, and uh, Morris family. I put this one in for my good friend Jackie Guthrie. Jackie's a big supporter of the Futurities, all kinds of, she's been involved in the Midwest, the select, she helped with the formation of the select sire. She also helped with the formation of the Breeder Challenge Futurity. Uh, and uh, she, is from Wisconsin, of course, and this is Rock River Dude. He was from Wisconsin. His claim to fame is he won the Futurity at the very first state Futurity, which was held in the state of Wisconsin, and Rock River Dude was the champion of one of the first classes there, and he was consigned to the sale a few years later. I don't think this filly even showed up at the sale, but she was consigned, and these catalogs are a great uh, history tool while we're staring at this beautiful headed filly. Of course, this is Lannon's sweetheart who went on to be uh, a great producer for Owen and Patsy Ziegler. Oz's Sweet Speculation was one of her famous foals and I've talked about this filly and I, I'll have a show on her later on too. And uh, the sweetheart head and everything she did. Uh, but uh, why I have this up, I'm gonna talk about the catalogs. You know, a lot of people been out asking if the catalogs are digital and does the office have have them stored somewhere. Well, you know, like any sales catalog, and Doug can talk about this when he comes on, they're meant to be disposable. They're a sales catalog. They're meant to look at like a Sears catalog, and then you buy something, and then they were meant to be discarded. Well, I'm glad they're, they weren't, because that's how I learned pedigrees so well, and I learned pictures and could uh, memorize different POAs throughout the years, because at a young age, I got a hold of a lot of these early catalogs from before when we got in, and that's how I put bloodlines and pictures and even names together and who was who. So even though they were meant to be discarded, most people keep them. Some of them are in poor shape because even the ones 
10, 15 years ago, some of them were made with subpar material and they just don't hold up the test of time, especially when you're using them. I have several copies of most of the sales catalogs dating back from uh, the early 60s. Some of them are in the magazine just like they did again in the 80s. They went back in the 80s and early 90s. They put it as an insert in the magazine. Here's another famous POA that was consigned to the sale many times. This was the year as sure weanling year in 1967. She was consigned by her breeder, the Mosers from Illinois, Bob Moser from Decatur, Illinois. They raised all those 7M POAs. They had the great stallion Ladies Warrior who became a legend and uh, so did 7M's Warriors Bonnet. She's in the Hall of Fame. She was only the second mare ever to win grand champion at the national show twice. She was bought by Stofus here from Illinois, not the Stofus from Ohio. Uh, I think she was owned by Carpenters from Ohio for a while. I know the Nemers family, she became their forever pony. And uh, even though they bred and owned a lot of POAs, Doc's family, I know uh, they kept her for a long time. And I'm pretty sure she died in Dubuque, Iowa as an old mare. Here she is when the Stofus family from Illinois consigned her. And when after she had been showing a while, you can tell she had a body. She was also a great performance mare as well. So here's a POA that never gets his credit, really. I think he's going to start more and more as time goes on. Uh, he was bred by one of my favorite breeders that I never got to meet, but the Lannans from Nebraska. Remember, there's the Lammers and the Lannans, both great breeders, tremendous breeders from the same state, and uh, they both use their names as their prefixes. And there was a lot of Lannans, Siri this and Siri that, and there was Super Dot, Super Spots, and all kinds of stuff. Well, this was Lannan Series Super Spot, and he sold for a lot of money back then, 1750 in 1967 as a yearling. He was bought by Ray Peets, and he went on to do a lot in, in, with the Driftwoods. And a lot of the loud colored POAs today can be traced back to Lannan Series Super Spot. And he was a loud leopard. His sire, Series Super Chief, was a loud leopard, and of course, so was Siri Chief. And they go back to the whole uh, Liberian leopard story. So a uh, long history of loud leopards, and you still can see it today. I seen pictures on breeders' phones in Tulsa just a couple weeks ago of newborn babies, and they were showing it to me, and I knew they traced back to Land and Siri Super Spot. Here's another old-time famous POA. This is one of the Tomahawks. Of course, Tomahawks is from John Ludwig in Pennsylvania. This is the Jeffers from Jeffries from Blackwell, Oklahoma. And uh, I know some of them may watch on here. Tomahawk's Big River was a famous POA by Danny Boy. And then Tomahawk's Buffalo Trail went on to do a lot, Supreme Champion. And he was consigned to the sale one year, sold for $2,400. Good price back then. And here is his sire, Tomahawk's Big River. And as I mentioned before, Dr. E.C. Phillips, he went by Kurt and the POAs, Kurt and Judy. Judy was one of the biggest promoters of all time in the POA breed. She did a lot of great things for POAs and uh, showed and, and bred some good POAs as well. And this is one of them they owned for a while, Tomahawk's Big River. Circle J's Hawkeye Joe, I put this in here because one of the auctioneers that was uh, a POA auctioneer at the national sale for many years was Aaron Jewell. And Aaron Jewell's sons, Chris and Kevin, both showed POAs. Kevin became a famous horse trainer and still is a well-known famous uh, horse trainer. I believe he lives in, I think, Georgia. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but they grew up in Iowa. I got to meet Aaron Jewell and his wife in 1987. My dad and Bud and Bertie Campbell took a trip down there and we got to go to the Latch family, Wayne Latches, and see their POAs. They had the McHugh POAs at the time. And then we went over to Aaron Jewell's and he gave me his complete magazine and sales catalog collection which included a lot of the sales that he'd done, and there was personal notes in there with his handwriting. And uh, later when I became an auctioneer, I really appreciated it because I could see 210, 220, 230. He, he would keep writing the bid he had so he could keep track of the bid, and that's pretty cool, and I cherish those books to this day. So this was one of his stallions that he consigned to Buckskin. He was pretty famous in his day, Circle J's Hawkeye Joe. He was by Bud Campbell's stallion, Coretz Hawkeye. 
So here's another Lammers. I know Mark's a big fan of this show. If you're a big fan and you talk to me on Instant Messenger and brag about my show, I'm going to include your horses. Tracy will see that later. She's one of the biggest contributors to the show, and her family's going to be included later on in this episode with some of the POAs that they've bought over the years. So this is Lammers Dandy Rascal. Uh, they bred a lot of loud color POAs as well. And there's that GR's Big Creek's Dandy we talked about earlier, that great yearling filly. Well, here's one of her young colts that went on to make a name for himself, Lammers Dandy Rascal. So here's a gilding. There's been quite a few POAs that became grand champion gildings. Some of them were already, then were consigned, but most of them, most of the gildings actually went on afterwards to become uh, the national show grand champion. This is one of the early ones. This is Johnny Charm. Johnny Charm was purchased from the Sharping Brothers out in South Dakota. They raised some great horses and POAs. They're the breeders of s such horses as Cricket McHugh, who was hard shipped into POAs. Of course, Black Swan S was bred by the Sharpings, probably the most famous one. But this is a POA that was grand champion early on, I believe in 72 or 73. And uh, his name is Johnny Charm. And there was Johnny and Jimmy Charm. I think Carl had both of them. And he sold them both, and I know this one was sold at the sale and for pretty good money back then. He went on, he, he went on to mature a lot more, and he was a good-looking gilding for his day. And, of course, Little John S. was a sharping bred stallion by Corrett Scottish Chieftain they had out there in, in South Dakota. So here's one of the early famous POAs. This is GR's Raindrop. I've talked about the Goldenrod Pony Farm before and the Stone and Morse family from Sheridan, Iowa. And uh, they sold this mare and she topped the sale for $3,900. And that would have been in 1974. So she was already 11 years old when she did that. She was the first Supreme Champion mare, I believe, of all time uh, in the POA breed. So she went on to do some things after this, but she'd already had a great career uh, when she was consigned in 74. In, uh, in 73, another famous mare was consigned the year before, and that's Totem Spots Magella. She was consigned by the Slagle family from Iowa that we've talked about already. Of course, she's from Michigan, Totem Spots Magella. They bred for a lot of great POAs. I believe that's Earl Clark. I never did know the history of Totems very well, but I need to study up on it because they bred some great uh, champion POAs, three grand champions for sure. And this is an own daughter of Series Spot Cash that was around forever. And uh, she was way ahead of her time, a great mare. And uh, she was she topped the sale in 19, let's see, it would have been 73, right? Yep, 1973. So the average that year was only $488. The top five ponies brought 2,602. And she topped the sale at 3,700. So in 152 POA is sold that year in 1973. 1973. Buyers from 22 different states bought POAs that year. That's one of the records. I think 24, 26 states might be the record uh, for purchasers in one year. Here's another great mare. She was consigned by her breeder, Lynn Puffenberger, as a yearling. You could tell there she had a lot of potential. She was a daughter and granddaughter of the famous Chief Littlebridge's Salty Dew. She went on to be a grand champion mare. That's when she was sold as a yearling. She was purchased by the Cheeseboroughs from New York, Anna Claire. And uh, this is her when they sold her, I think, in 75. She sold for $3,000. And uh, in 75, that wouldn't have been the record. But they averaged 682 in 75, and your high seller was 3500 so your top five averaged 3,060. So she was right in there almost in the top five. But the next year in 1976, she became your international show grand champion mare, Salty Dew. Rexanne, I know a lot of people remember Rexanne. She was a beautiful POA, owned daughter of Siri Rex. Siri Rex was the 1970 grand champion stallion, and this was one of his famous foals. And we're going to show her sire here, and we're going to show one of her famous uh, colts as well, a 1984 colt that sold in the sale. Here's another Lammers, Lammers Whiskey. 
The reason I got her in here is several reasons. Uh, Mark Lammers for one, and my good friend Doc Nemers. Doc purchased this mare, and he bred her to a quarter horse stallion named Puff Man. And in 1975, a bay, solid bay filly came out that he named Doc's Miss Puff. And a lot of people might have just discarded that mare, but with the breeding of her and the way she was built, long neck, way ahead of her time in the neck, he kept her. And good thing he did, because there's POAs winning today that is a result of that breeding. And uh, he bred her to double tough five or six times. Doc's tough dude, Doc's built tough, both became champions. And then Doc's double sweet, who created a dynasty herself, uh, kids double sweets her daughter, and kids double sweets the mother to the silver kid, the leading sire of all time. And then Doc's double sweet is also the mother to the Crisco kid and a lot of famous other ones. Uh, so anyway, uh, that was the cross when he bred this mare to the quarter horse. And then he also bred this mare to double tough, and then he consigned them to the 77 sale. And that was quite a sale, 1977, one of the best of all times. And her colt on her side when Doc did that was Doc's Tough Cookie. And, of course, he went on. He was a few spot in our snow cap, and he went on to become a Hall of Fame POA and a great sire for Harper Krupp of Ohio. Here's another good-looking filly way ahead of her time. Slagles again. Slagles were a big part of the sale. You know, they were from Davenport, Iowa, the Quad Cities over there, and they always supported the sale, both purchasing and consigning. And uh, this is Vicky too, an own granddaughter of Coretz, Indian Boy, and Siri Chief. So for her grandsires to be that early on, she sure had more of a modern look. And she would have been about two in that picture. TW's Firefly again became a cornerstone for the pe people that purchased her, and that's the Scheideckers from Wisconsin. Uh, Scheideckers' uh, two daughters were in POAs for a long time with their kids, the Free Tags from Wisconsin, and of course the Cozers from Wisconsin. They both did well, and the Cozers showed many of uh, Firefly's offspring. Anything with fly or fire in it pretty much came from them like gold fire. Uh, Fly the Gold is a grandson of her, I believe. He just went in the Hall of Fame this year in 2021. So there's a lot of famous uh, fireflies in Preston. I could go on and on, all the fireflies. Uh, they won the Select Sire Futurity several times. Cowboy Brass won the Futurity, and he goes back to them. So she came to Gold Prince. That's right, Jan. She did come to Gold Prince. And Tracy, sorry I'm not reading all your comments, but I'm busy uh, talking here. But keep commenting. You're doing good. Doc's Miss Firefly, that's right. She was the first one uh, that won. She was the 83 uh, filly that won, and she was out of this mare. Then they bred Doc's Miss Firefly and, and produced a lot of good ones like the one I'm saying. Uh, I think, was it Cowboy Up, or what was his name, the the Palomino Leopard that won by uh, Admiral. But anyway, her Cowboy Brass, one of those. Uh, but she uh, she became, like I say, the cornerstone broodmare for that Wisconsin family. And she came from the Cannons from Texas who had the TW for Twin Willow. That was their prefix. Moving on here, here's Tom Ox, Big Creek again. He did top the sale twice, so we'll have him in here twice. And uh, he, he did a lot. Of course, he was in that... Uh, procession that was four grand champion stallions that'll probably never be done again his sire was grand then he was and then he had a son go grand and that stallion produced a son that went grand so four generations they did it in 63 66 71 and 74 uh, respectively and with that we'll put the POA history banner on there so the 11th International POAC, Inc., so the Pony of America Club Incorporated, their sale shatters records. So they were proud of this, and that was, uh, you know, 153 lots sold for uh, $62,000, so total. So let's see what year that would have been. That would have been in 67, I believe. So, yep, 153 lots. I have that right here. 22 states, purchasers from 22 states. Uh, the top five averaged 2001, which was by far the biggest top five at that point. It hadn't even, let's see, the highest before that was probably 1,700 years earlier. 
So, but the average was still down to 406, but you got to remember there was a lot of young stock that was probably bringing 125, 150. Back then they didn't have the $200 minimum like they did for years and years. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that, but you had to get, and I guess it's still that way, but you have to get a $200 bid uh, to get a bid to, to start it, to get it going. So here's the stallion I mentioned earlier from California. Of course, he was born in Arizona, but it's Siri Rex. He was the 1970 grand champion. One of his claim to fame as a sire was Rex Ann. He sired some other good stuff too. Of course, Dean Kenny from California was a great promoter of POAs. Starikers Firecracker, we just showed one of his daughters, Cannons bought him. And so this is kind of out of, a little bit out of place, but not really because I'm showing some famous stallions that went through. But uh, GR's 10 Grand was one of his sons. Of course, TW's Firefly. He went to uh, Golden Rods and then he went to Cannons. Uh, and Star Acres was uh, Gene Adams from Nebraska, another early great breeder of POAs. We still have a granddaughter of Siri Rex, so that's cool. Considering he won grand champion uh, 51 years ago at the national show. Another famous stallion, Smokey Bridges. He was gilded, eventually gilded. Here again is Cannons. I've mentioned them several times. So they had just bought the one I just showed, and now they were selling this one, Smokey Bridges. The own son of Chief Little Bridges. Of course, he became an all everything. Uh, show stallion and sire So here's one of the most famous ever This is paper tiger. He started out in Iowa and he went all over mainly in the east especially in New York and uh, Then of course he ended up in Alabama and changed history with the steel family a lot of the KS's trace back to paper tiger steels had been raising POAs for quite a while while they were active in the military and uh, buying POAs and keeping them at Ken's uh, folks' place. But when they retired and came home back to Alabama and purchased Paper Tiger, that changed everything. He, uh, his mother, Chinooks Flaxy, was a great mare. Uh, the Eck Rope girls from just down the road here in Hennessy, Oklahoma, showed her. She became a famous mare after Paper Tiger was an aged stallion even. And then, of course, Joker's High Tiger was an own son of Joker B. Here's another famous stallion, was in the sale a couple times, just like, uh, what's his name, like uh, Paper Tiger, and this is Salty Three Bars, and both times he was in the sale, uh, he went grand after the two times he was in. He was consigned, I believe, in 75, and then again in 78. This would have been 75, I think, so let's see, 77, yeah. But anyway, uh, well, let's see, though, no, this would have been 78 probably 78 and Lynn bought him and he went grand in Oklahoma City in 1979 so yeah Phillips bought him in 75 I believe he was three when he was consigned the first time and this picture here this is when he broke the record that would have been um, I think 5300 he topped the sale and he was the high selling stallion at the time and he held that record for quite a while actually until 1983 this was the high seller when he was consigned that year, Ken Wills Copper Chief. He's got a lot of horse breeding in him. Actually, he don't have any POA in him. He's got all Appaloosa breeding and then a Welsh on the very bottom side there. Uh, but he went to Wisconsin. The Coinkey family had him. And, of course, the Cobb family was well known from Ohio. He was a big, big strap and stallion back then, Ken Wills Copper Chief. Again, a great program in Colorado, the Ken Wills, Ken and... Wilma Bateman. Plotted's High Bar was a Klein's POA that Ruth Pecoy renamed. She purchased him and renamed him Plotted's High Bar. It was a little easier to do that back then. He's another POA. If you look at the pedigree, he's all horse. His mother was a POA, Klein's High Up Kitten, uh, but if you look at her parents, they're both Appaloosas. So she was hard shipped and then she was bred to St. Andy himself, who was an Appaloosa. And out came Plotted's High Bar. He became the 1980 Grand Champion. And then oh, we're going to talk about what he did to Salty Three Bars record in a little bit. But it, uh, it was a famous part of POA history in 1983. And we're going to get to that pretty quick. So, Doug, if you're following, around, following along from Ohio, uh, I'll be calling you here pretty quick, probably maybe a half an hour or so. I'll be giving you a call, give or take. 
So this is Klein's Bold Legend. Again, plot at Sidebar was a Klein's. He was actually registered as a Klein's. And uh, look at this. This is what I'm talking about, the sale here. You know, sometimes they sell for 4000 or 14000 This gilding, well, he was a stallion at the time. That might be why. Uh, he is a snowcap, but he became a famous, famous Hall of Fame gilding, Klein's Bold Legend. Uh, Klein's, his breeders, consigned him to the sale as a stallion, and he went to Wisconsin where he... He became famous in Wisconsin. He only sold for $450. He's a half-brother to Plotted Tie Bar. So one became a high seller and a grand champion stallion, and this one became a supreme champion and Hall of Fame gilding. So here's Santee Accent Bars. He no-sailed in this sale. This would have been 1980. Gene was starting to go a different direction here. This is the year Tough Plot it was born. But this was one of Gene's main stallions before the Tough Plotted era. Hard to Beat was a, a regional champion, Appaloosa. He was a racehorse, basically. His mother is very famous, uh, J&B's little uh, red rose. I have pictures of her, and I have pictures of Hard to Beat, too. Of course, Mr. Tonobars was a famous court horse, racehorse. Uh, Hard to Beat is actually the grandsire to Tough to Beat. The POA, that's how he got his name. He lent, lent his name to him. Uh, but Gene had this uh, uh, Richlands on the bottom side there. That was his good friend, Dr. John Enburn from South Dakota. Uh, so this was Santee Accent Bars. And we're just going to take a little stroll down the Santee sale uh, memories here for a little bit. This was Gene Wright's in here. This was the best baby they had had. So far, that was in 1977. If you notice the price, 2100 that was a pretty big price. I don't know if Santee Supreme Bars uh, was lucky enough to go on and have a good career, but Bar Supreme was one of Gene's uh, apps. And then, of course, Richland's Pole Kitty was one of his foundation cornerstone mares, again, from John Edinburgh. She was a reserve grand champion as a young mare and way ahead of her time. And Gene purchased her at the international sale, even though both men were from uh, pretty close there in South Dakota and knew each other. Uh, they hauled her to Iowa, and the Carr family bought her and brought her back to her home state of South Dakota. And he used her for years. Uh, a lot of the, you know, there's been a lot of Santee Foxy Lady and Santee Prince Leo and all that stuff. And then, of course, later, Carbine and Pistol and all those, they're all through Richland's full kitty. So this was one of her early ones, uh, Santee's Supreme Bars. And then for a long time, Gene consigned a lot, and in the 80s and stuff, when the prices weren't uh, the greatest and the and uh, tough plot, it wasn't that famous yet. He was getting three, four hundred dollars for his foals, but that was all about the change. For decades, he uh, did well in the futurity, and he sold a lot of high-priced babies. The reason I put this in here because I found him from the 91 sale, and somebody just asked on Facebook if anybody had pictures of Santee Saladin and uh, here he is as a baby Santee Saladin of course he went to the Irwin family from California they made him a famous POA stallion he won a lot of stuff out in California and at the national show so here's 6 SDB's Minnesota's Mr. Magnificent I need a drink of water after I said that but anyway he uh, was born in Minnesota. He became a famous, long-lasting POA. A lot of famous POA kids rode him even when he was in his late 20s. He was at the sale at least once. Another famous POA, Picoy's Little Chief. Again, Cheeseboro family from New York. He was consigned several times to the sale. He was a supreme champion POA stallion that was ridden by a lot of families. Another famous little bitty POA, little cute guy. If we had POA, some POAs like this right now, he'd be popular. 48 inches. I know the Phillips family had him in Ohio. The Lewis family had him in Minnesota. And he was just a cool POA. And that's T.A. Big Creek's Brave. Now here's one of the reasons I became such a historian. And I know if the Aston family's watching from Georgia and the Behringer family from Illinois, this horse was a big part of their life. He wasn't a big part of my life, but the people that introduced him back into POAs were from Minnesota. And they're the brother to 
the Simonson brothers here. That was so their uncle was my next door neighbor, which was a mile away out in the country. But he was an auctioneer. I can't seem to get away from auctioneers, but he was an auctioneer and a horseman and he raised hogs and was a farmer, lived a mile from us. Good horseman. And anyway, we bought a quarter horse mare to breed into POAs from his brother who lived about 40 miles away. And uh, he had a catalog from 1977 where he'd consigned their little state fair champion POA. He'd won all kinds of POA stuff, but not her pony stuff, but not in POAs. They'd showed him at the state fair for like four years and their kids had outgrown him. And that was little Joe T. And he went on to go to, like I said, the Behringers and the Astons and a lot of famous kids rode him when they were young. He's, he was a little bitty guy. I mean, barely 46 inches. But I remember, like it was yesterday, I was probably 10, 11 years old, uh, Lyle Simonson reaches up on the dash of his pickup and hands me, I should have it with me right now, but a 1977 sales catalog. And he said, here, you guys are in POAs, take this. And I wore that thing out cover to cover. And there was so many famous POAs in that 77 sale that I wrote an article about it 20 years later about that sale, one of the best sales ever. And here's the reason why. Warrior Shamrock was in that sale, a supreme champion, sold for $4,600. Salty Little Britches, supreme champion, all around everything POA, $5,200. And one of the most famous gildings ever, Rutledge's Yoka Chigger Pep, no sale at 5000 But the funny thing is, he was already a household famous name. He was seven years old in that sale, already a supreme champion. And in 1984, he became the grand champion at the Iowa International Show. So seven years after this uh, sale, after this consignment ad here, he was a grand champion. He was grand champion many times at the International Show. Here's another famous POA gilding that was in the sale more than once. Poconata's jackpot, he became a grand champion. He was owned by the Neblocks and uh, several other families like the Hoffman family. Cricket McHugh, so this would be the 78 sale. And uh, Carl consigned quite a few good POAs to the 78 sale, Carl Oz. And Cricket McHugh from the Sharping Brothers was one of them. Of course, she was por purchased by Wayne Latch. And in 1981, he'd make her the grand champion mayor at the, night, at the Oklahoma City International Show uh, three years after the sale. And she won in Iowa. I think she won her class in 78, but she didn't go grand. Here's a famous, famous POA. She was consigned to the 1979 sale, and she was a 79. And that's Cayuga's Bambi. She grew up to be another cute little small POA, do everything, been there, done that POA. She was one of the first famous ones by Series Silver Prince. And uh, Series Silver Prince was consigned to the sale from Paula Cooper of Arizona in 77, purchased by George Lalonde, the executive secretary at the time. This is his wife, Pat, showing that they had the Cayugas. And quite a few people bred to Series Silver Prince, Midwest people that had never got to see him before and because uh, he was in Arizona and in 79 his first Midwest crop first real full crop he ever had was born and Cayuga's Bambi had become a Hall of Famer and looked there sold for $500 as a little baby yep Tracy she was almost solid as a baby she showed though she showed at the Midwest and she showed as a baby she was leading the nation I think as a baby so at that same sale, if you can imagine, another famous prospect. Uh, here is JBJ's Made of Straw, one of Jackie Blazer's first real superstars, became a versatility champion, touched the hearts of a lot of POA families that owned her in uh, Illinois, Colorado, and California, let alone Jackie. And uh, she sold for 2300 She won as a baby, and she won as a yearling with Jackie, and then she consigned her. So she was in the same sale as a Bambi, but Bambi was a baby and made of straw was a yearling. Helps put Double L Dickens on the map as a POA sire. Another famous gilding, I just grabbed this picture. He was in the sale at least once, but Hoodoo Fox, I just like to say that name, but he sold for three grand. He was fairly old in this sale, 
Uh, but he was, uh, again, an iron gilding that would just go and go. He showed all over the country and was owned by families from many different states. St. Nick's Beggar Bars. If you know who St. Nick's Beggar Bars is, you're a pretty good historian. But you may know who Casey Colorado Chief and Kelly Curtis is. And Kelly's late mother just passed away a few years ago. Jean wrote a lot of stuff about this horse. And Kelly actually submitted something to uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul about when they were traveling later on, all the miles they put on. Uh, but this is another great St. Nicholas Pony Farm. POA and he ended up not having the St. Nick's name but he became a famous famous POA as KC Colorado Chief and uh, I'm not sure if he's in the Hall of Fame but he should be but he uh, he is an all round champion gilding Jackpots Misty here's a little Philly or Missy that uh, yeah Misty $400 Puffinbarger somebody wrote that's before my time about a year before I started uh, paint before we were even in POA is 81. So consigned by the Damons, that's uh, Dean's mother there, consigned her. And uh, Lynn didn't buy a lot of stuff at the sale, but when he did, he'd take it home and he'd turn it loose on his ranch and he'd end up uh, raising stuff out of it. And there's a lot of stuff that traced back, uh, even when Lynn passed away a few years ago, there was still stuff traced back to Jackpot's Misty. So she was a color producer and it really helped his program. And, of course, good breeding, too, good earlier uh, 70s type, 60s and 70s, good uh, breeding. Here's Doc's Built Tough. He's the full brother to Doc's Tough Dude, who had went grand two years in a row. Uh, Built Tough won as a baby, and then he sold for $3,000 as a yearling, so he set a record. That record started falling pretty fast, but uh, I... I wrote an article one time about Doc's Colts, and uh, you could write an article about the broodmares Doc raised and the Colts, and of course everything Doc Nemers has contributed to POA is Julian G. Nemers, and we all affectionately call him Doc because he's an orthopedic surgeon, and he used it as a prefix, Doc's. And anyway, uh, as Doug can talk to when he comes on, uh, he sold a lot of famous Colts and a lot of Colts for big money, and uh, this one wouldn't even be that high on the list now at 3000 He sold many for over that over the years. Here's Series Brush Fire. This was at the 81 sale as well. She sold for $4,900. She's the full sister to Series Sparkle Champagne. And she went to Iowa to the Borjohns. And she's in a lot of pedigrees. And she's in some of Doc's pedigrees because of High Plains Heat Wave. Uh, High Plains Drifter bred this mare and got High Plains Heat Wave, and uh, Doc used her for many years. And uh, 4900 didn't top the sale that year because another full sister to a famous POA did, and that is this mare right here, which is uh, East Acres, uh, what's her name, Double Trouble, I believe. And, or let's see, I got it right here. It's blocked off there. Double treat. East Acres double treat. Of course, I've known that since I was a kid. She's a full sister to East Acres Tough to Beat. And she nudged out a uh, series brush fire by 100 bucks. Was sold to the Isle family of Wisconsin. Consigned by uh, the California family there. And she was a full sister to East Acres Tough to Beat. And she was a great looking mare. Uh, double treat, East Acres double treat. So that's kind of funny, full sisters to two famous POAs, and uh, they both sold for good money in 1981. But East Acres double treat topped the sale at 5000 Another high seller in 81, I believe he broke the gilding record, and that was Cinnamon Straw. And we mentioned Double L's Dickens earlier, and this was another full of his early on. 78 was his first full crop, and he produced two greats. JBJ's made a straw and then c cinnamon straw and Jeff Koroleski made cinnamon straw a supreme champion at four years of age the tender age of four and uh, so this was actually 82 not 81 this would have been 82 at the sale and uh, he probably would have topped that sale at six thousand dollars if it hadn't been for Pokey Plotted. Pokey Plotted broke the record she smashed the record selling for eight thousand dollars and uh, in 1982, that was a lot of money in 1982. The average that year with her selling for so much was 
uh, $1,118. The top five went for $52.40, and the top 10 averaged $42.40. And uh, buyers from 24 different states purchased POAs that year, and there was 148 sold, I think, just in the ring. Some of these statistics are just in the ring, and some are c included barn sales, especially in the late 90s and the 2000s, they started including barn sales. So we got a lot about Pokey Plotted here because she did get so famous. She's in the Hall of Fame, and she uh, she was bred by uh, the Victor family of Iowa, and uh, she sold twice at the sale. And here's a write-up about she's not getting older, she's getting better. Here's her picture here that was in the magazine. High-selling POA at the international sale. Well, she was consigned again in 19... 85 so three years later and the market was way down in 85 and she still managed to bring six thousand dollars so she would have been in the top oh five or so of POAs at the time uh, for twice she would have been in, in the top 10 for sure and as her pedigree shows there kid plaudits her sire uh, Howard Victor went to the Carl Miles uh, dispersal sale to get him he was a grandson double grandson of Prince Plaudit and then, of course, Pokey was one of their early POAs. And uh, I have pictures of her, not tonight, but when I do a story, an episode about the victors, we'll be looking at uh, pictures of Pokey. So Pokey Plotted, one of the, the all-time greats. So also, and uh, that was, was 82. So now we move on to 1983. And 83 was a pretty big sale. And uh, then things started kind of going a little down because of the economy. But Gold Chip sold for 5400 He broke the yearling record. You can see he was purchased by Walls there. Of course, he was sold by his breeder, Leonard Lewis. Uh, he went on to have a futurity named after him in his memorial. And uh, Gold Chips went on to win grand the next year. He'd come back to sell for a lot of money again in one of the Indianapolis sales. So this was the second to last sale in Iowa. This was in 1983. Katie Cayuga sold at the sale. What's famous about her is she was the last POA bred by famous POAers, uh, George and Pat Lalonde, the people that had Cayugas. So she was named Katie Cayuga, but uh, that because Lalonde's didn't register, but they were the, he was the executive secretary all throughout the 70s. They moved from Texas to Iowa to help run the POA club. Uh, but they had bred for a lot of great Cayugas in Texas and continued in Iowa. And like Cayugas Cricket, Cayugas Frosty Patches, the Lewis's had, and their kids and grandkids rode her. And this is a granddaughter of her. So an own daughter of Siri Silver Prince. Tough Pants. Another good POA that went through the sale is a yearling. Bred by the James Black family. The Steele family copied the same foundation, breeding... Uh, Smoky Pants, the Docks Double Date, and they got a lot of good KS's ponies. Bud Campbell loved to breed loud colors, and here was Campbell's Kaleida, 1981 Colt. He had Mrs. Kaleida and Campbell's Kaleida. He went to, the, I believe, the Ross of Colorado. Yeah, Tracy mentioned Gold Chips won the first select sire for charity, yep, and then he won, won as a yearling at the national show, and then he won grand champion as a two-year-old. But he won his class as a yearling. Here's another good yearling in the early 80s. This is Kenwell's Bartell. Unfortunately, he died at a young age. He was purchased by a family from Arizona and met a freak accident. But he was a, a son of two famous POAs. Telly Doe was an all horse uh, supreme champion POA. And then, of course, Barkeeper became a legend. It's too bad this colt didn't mature to become a sire because he was built and colored really nice. East Acres Gold Bar with the East Acres gentleman, Max Nebergall, who finally went into the Hall of Fame. He's, you know, Max is very responsible for great programs like the Nemers, the Kennedys program, my family's program, the Rorks. Uh, he's the foundation to a lot of great programs. And uh, he named this colt, but he was actually bred by Ray Peets. And uh, Chris Woods from Ohio that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes purchased him and showed him and did well with him. And then, of course, the Neblocks made him a household name as a champion gilding. East Acres Gold Bar, I know a lot of people remember him. 
kind of a fuzzy picture here, but I laugh at this picture. Kenwell's barmaid topped the sale as a baby. Her half-sister, barkeeper's Barbie doll, topped the, the baby fillies in 79, and then the Wheeling fillies was topped by this filly in 1980. And then the Rankins from California sold some stuff uh, the next year, and they brought her back, and she was over height, if you can believe it or not, because Kenwell's barmaid didn't grow up to be that overly tall of a mare. Of course, she's one of the greatest mares ever to wear a saddle and a POA ring and a Western pleasure phenomenon. And she helped make Barkeeper as famous as he became. Another famous POA consigned as a yearling by again Max Nebergall. The Krugers made this mare famous. Danielle and her made each other famous, and that's Black Swan S. And she was consigned to the 83 sale. And then at, in 84, she went reserve grand as a two year old. And in 86, she went grand. And then, of course, she won a bunch of classes with Danielle at the national show. Hall of Famer, Black Swan S. So the first sale I attended as a kid was the 1983 sale. Uh, we were in POAs. We got into POAs in 82. We got the catalog in the mail in 82. That was the first catalog we actually received uh, from the club, not from someone else. Excuse me. And in 83, they had a special sale during the sale. And the Franklin family consigned, they were getting out of POAs, and they consigned six of their POAs to the sale under the condition that half the proceeds go to the Lance Scott Memorial. Not Memorial, he was still alive, but he'd been hurt in an accident, and he needed money for a chair and things like that. And so the Franklins generously donated the, their POAs, all six of them, to the POA club with the stipulation that half the money go towards Lance's needs and then the other half went to the POAC and that made for some interesting outcomes and of course plot its high bar was Brett Franklin's great stallion and he he did well he was a good showman and that was a good stallion we talked about him earlier plot its high bar and he sold for six thousand dollars and broke salty three bars record by six hundred dollars and the Depew family from Indiana purchased him, I believe, for Chris. I know Tony really well, but I believe Chris is the one that rode Plotted Cybar. And uh, a lot of famous POA people bid on these POAs because it was helping such a good cause. It was helping Lance Scott, who was a POA kid, and also the POA club. Remember earlier I talked about Skaggs? Cherokee Fox's Princess and the young 30 some year old Lynn Puffenbarger holding her well at this sale they they consigned a daughter of her by Joker three bars and at the time and I think probably ever that was the only POA by Joker three bars and he was advertised heavily in the Appaloosa News and later the Appaloosa World and Journal uh, I have pictures of him in my filing cabinet at home but anyway this filly was purchased by uh, Lynn for $1,200 for two reasons. One, because he wanted to help out, help the club, and help Lance Scott. And two, he had owned the mother. So, and a lot of salty JJ bars. And then my brother ended up with a granddaughter of this filly right here, uh, a salty mare that he bought at a sale. So, and then down below is Sure South there. And he was an own son of Deep South, the famous Appaloosa racehorse. So Franklin's was breeding some uh, Appaloosas that no one else was breeding back in the day. And uh, like I say, a lot of Paul Passy bought one of the mares. And one of the mares was a Dragon Inns, and uh, it raised quite a bit of money for, uh, for both uh, places there, the POA Club and the Scott Foundation. So at that same sale, there was some famous weanlings. Hollow Notes was one of them, 15, or 1850. And he, went, he stayed in Wisconsin. Uh, the Smith family bought him. Of course, he's been around all over Odie, and uh, he became a famous Double L. Dickens son. Of course, the Morris and Hampton family from Oklahoma had him for a long, long time. And then the Baron won the Select Sire Futurity in 1983, the beautiful colored Baron. And he helped Doc Stuff Tiger become a, a household name. He sold for 1750 and went to Wisconsin. So he ended up battling 
uh, Hollow Notes a little bit and some other famous 1983 Colts. That'll be an episode one day. I've alluded to it before, but all the, there was four or five Colts from Wisconsin that showed in 1984 in the great trailer race. They went all over the country, but they were all from the same state showing yearling Colts. So this is from the 84 sale now. This would have been the last sale held in uh, Des Moines for that time. Of course, it moved to Indianapolis for 85, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, the only four years it was in Indianapolis. And this is Touch of Gold. And he became a famous stallion out in Washington. And he's an own son of Gold Prince. And then uh, Rex Ann, we showed a picture of her earlier. And we showed a picture of Siri Rex. So here's their colt, Touch of Gold, who became a pretty well-known, especially in the Northwest, sire. This picture was actually from a little later. Uh, but I just wanted to include the Van Eyck's from... Uh, Florida, the wooden shoe breeders, uh, they consigned a lot of POAs over the years, and I just picked one random. Uh, and they, they had a lot in the sale. They helped promote the sale all the way from Florida. It didn't seem like no matter where the sale was held, uh, they would consign POAs. So we're pretty much getting into Doug Sarl country here. Uh, I'm going to call him in a minute, but... In 1984-85, uh, a lot of stuff was going on in the POA world. Uh, if you check the minutes, I know uh, Dave Morris has a record of every board minute ever taken in, uh, from the history of time. And it's interesting if you go back and look at the 84-85 minutes because they decided to move from Iowa. Uh, Mason City, they just felt, was too small to host the club anymore so they decided to go to Indianapolis and around the same time they decided to raise the height the maximum height from 54 inches to 56 inches so that took place in 86 and another thing that took place in 86 that maybe wasn't that big a fanfare at the time but two new auctioneers uh, took over the sale because Dick Dinsdale had been doing the sale for quite a few years uh, why it was in Iowa, it was in Mason City, uh, Marshalltown, and then, of course, Des Moines for the longest. Well, it was in Mason City for a long time, too. And uh, probably about 15, not even 15, maybe 12 auctioneers, Aaron Jewell and some other ones. And then at, towards the end of the Iowa run, Dick Dinsdale did the sale. But when it went to Indianapolis, they looked for some new auctioneers, and they come up with Chris Woods and Doug Sorrell. And I'm going to give Doug a call here. It's about 8.40 his time. Let's see, Ohio. I'm here. Let me see if people can hear you, Doug. Let's see. Tracy, tell me if you can hear Doug Sorrell. You listened to him for 25 years, so. Say hello, Doug. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> I don't know if she can hear you or not. I can't. I can't hear you the best. I got the Bluetooth hooked up. Can't hear him. Let's see. We can't hear you right now, Doug. Let's see what's going on. I know I have Bluetooth on. Let's see. Scan. There we go. You're going to pop in here any minute. Say hello now. Okay. There you go. I can hear you. Tracy? Tracy. How are things in Florida? <laughs> How are things in Florida, he's asking. I can hear you now, Doug, so people should be able to hear you pretty quick. Good. Wonderful. Good. I got you in my right ear anyway, so uh, we'll see how they can hear you. If not, I'll just enjoy it, but I want everybody else to enjoy. These videos usually get, you know, about 1,000 views or so. Tonight, we might have, you know, maybe 50 people live or less, but uh, they'll, they'll tune in throughout the weeks and months. So, uh, Well, I think we can hear you good now, Doug, so I want to thank you for Joining, of course, uh, you were a huge part of POAs, 
And uh, you were always a great storyteller, so that's why I thought of bringing you on tonight because uh, I know you can, uh, you know, you can ramble on. Tracy says hi, Doug. So good. <laughs> so, so I was just talking. I don't know if you're watching the show or not, Doug, but uh, I was talking. I've been watching for. I've been watching about the last half hour. Half hour. It was okay. Fascinating that uh, some of the ponies that went through the sale and were cataloged, you know, years later, over my 25 years, uh, they pop up as being uh, dams or sires or involved with hundreds of the ponies that I sold, hundreds. Oh, right. And, uh, yeah, so it was great watching the history and all the names of the people and and where they were from. It just uh, tons of very, very fond memories just come flooding back great great well you did the sale i believe about 25 years but you did a lot of regional sales too didn't you in utah and and all over i believe i, I did yeah. um, i did the international sale i started and worked with chris woods of course which you told everyone and chris was out of ohio i knew chris uh, chris and i had worked quarter horse sales for blair folk who founded the quarter horse congress and uh, or came up with the idea of it and uh, chris and i were both ring men for blair at the congress and of course at uh, the sales at tattersalls and uh, so when i end up in indianapolis thanks really to doc phillips and judy okay. uh, i i was very familiar with chris i knew chris was an auctioneer i knew he was in the our business, I knew he was in POAs. And uh, over the 25 years, I had the opportunity to work regional sales in eight states. So uh, wow, it was a it was a, it was a great run, right. great run, right. And it all was because of the Ohio Club there that got you started. So it was. Yeah. Do you want me to want me to tell the story? Yeah, tell the story, Doug. Well, our family had a pretty significant tax shop in Ohio. And uh, Doc and Judy had two daughters, Sally Phillips and Kathy Pickrell. And uh, Kathy came to me one day and she knew I'd been to auction school. And a buddy and I had done our own little punk and roller auction in Springfield, <laughs> Ohio, that didn't amount to much. And uh, so Kathy says, uh, would you like to do a POA auction for the Ohio club and it was up around Columbus someplace. And I go, sure. Cause you know, I'm wanting to get my foot in the door. Right. And, um, I had started out gluing hip numbers on horses <laughs> in Lexington, Kentucky and driving 125 miles one way to do it. So yeah, I'm happy to go up around Columbus and, <laughs> and actually be the auctioneer. Right. Uh, so I went up and, and did the sale. Uh, d did it for nothing. Told them, I'll just do it for free. And uh, we did so good at that sale that the club sent me 125 bucks after the fact. <laughs> and I thought I hit the, the lottery. Right. Uh, I, yeah. And, and that actually started it. Uh, next thing you know, I get a phone call and the sale was coming to Indianapolis. And would I be interested in sharing the sale with Chris Woods. Right. Well, of course I was. Right. And uh, that's kind of how I became introduced to the POAs, and it really became a love affair. Because right. some people do things, uh, and they do it like for the money, and some people do things for the love of it. And my association with the POAs was actually the perfect scenario because I got the opportunity to go all over the country and meet people that I really enjoyed being around. You and met doing some something lifelong that, friends, right? Oh, right. absolutely. Right. And, and so, you know, I loved doing this and then I got paid. I mean, it was, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. it was the best of both worlds. You couldn't beat it. They say when you do something and you get paid to do something you love, you know, that's, you, you can't beat that. And that's what you're well, doing. And and they also say when you do that, you 
you're you're never working. Right. But trust me, at the end of those Fridays and Saturday nights, when I was doing them all by myself, <laughs> whether it was Des Moines or Tulsa, right. I was pretty tired. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. people that weren't around back then, uh, Doug did the sale by himself for probably 20 years of the 25 he did it. And, uh, you know, there was usually 200 or more consigned. A lot of them would no sell. Not a lot, but, you know, like every sale, a percentage would no sell. And he'd work just as hard on those. I used to look over and see your face, and you'd just kind of look. You'd look at me sometimes once we got to know each other better. And then you'd just pick up and start telling your jokes and move on, you know. But you might get six to $10,000 bid on something, and they'd no sell it. And it just, you know, kind of killed the momentum. Yeah. Well, um, the most famous probably no sale, and I know she won't be upset about it because she's a dear friend of mine. And as odd as it might seem, I can remember where people sat. Right. And uh, she always sat just to the right of the center aisle in the front row. And she was from Maryland. And uh, she brought me a brood mare. And uh, I think she was a, she might have been a quarter. But uh, we worked and worked and worked, and I got up to $6,000 on that mare, and I thought, surely I've done a really good job. <laughs> and Sharon loved that mare so much. She got up, and she was she was weeping. She had <laughs> tears on her cheeks. She's like, I just can't sell the mare. <laughs> well, I don't know who was on the stand with me, but we worked really, really hard to get to that kind of money. Right. And, you know, it was okay. It was okay. I understood. I understood it perfectly. Right. But I will always remember how hard I had to work to get to where we got, and uh, she she just the tears streaming down her cheeks. I just can't sell the mare. Right. Sharon, it's okay. It's okay. I fully understand. Well, the international POA sale probably became one of the most most emotional horse sales in history because not only people selling, you know, giving away their their beloved ponies, but a lot of the kids and a lot of times they'd be young girls and young boys, but they'd run into the ring and they'd take a photo op, you know, but they'd be crying and all the parents would be crying and then the, the grandpa or whoever, you know, that it was always a fun time, but it was very emotional a lot of times. You know, when you're in the auction business and it's really a smaller group of people than a lot would believe. And we we know each other and we know who does what kinds of auctions. And uh, I'd run into my buddies that we'd be doing a horse auction somewhere. And uh, I'd say, you know, I got to tell you these stories because <laughs> nobody else did a sale like the POA. I mean, they don't. No, it, 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 no, it's the POA don't. way. And a lot of that, you know, was your way too. you, you uh, held that standard but you didn't rush families. You didn't rush the pedigree no. readers. And uh, no. they would take the saddles off and stuff. But you go to a normal horse sale or like I'm in the car business. You go to a car auction and a minute or less, it's gone. You know, they roll the car right. in and off the lane, they call it. And it's gone. Well, we'd read pedigrees for two to five minutes before you, the paid guy, would even get to talk. You know, you know? <laughs> if, if, I could, if I could sell 12 an hour, I felt like I was rushing. Right. You know, I remember you looking and, at your watch, but really it was just a moot oh, point because we were going to stay there till two in the morning if you had to. If, you know. if that's what it took. Right. And and this is the only sale in the world. And actually, I look forward to it. At right. some point every year for 25 years, there'd be some little girl. She's somewhere between nine and 12. She'd be in the ring selling her pump. And, at, you know, at some point they're going to take off the saddle. Right. And at some point, I'm, they're going to put on the show halter then, and we're just kind of going to patiently let this all happen. And then she's going to look at me and share that the only reason she is selling this pony is so she can have money for tuition to go to college because right. she's going to be a brain surgeon. It would happen every year. And I actually look forward to it, and I cherish those memories. It was just the best. <laughs> and they'd crawl under their bellies, and they'd pull on their tails. I had a family bring a little pony one time. That It was a little pony, and it had no show record on it whatsoever, but it was dead broke. And they brought out a blue tarp that they'd bought at Home Depot or 
Fleeton Farm or something, and stood this pony on this blue tarp. And about four kids crawled all over this pony. Right. And underneath it and pulling the tails and in between its legs. And I just sat and watched all this. And that little old pony ended up bringing, I don't know, $2,500, dollars Right. The father looked at me and he said, bless you. Bless you. I mean, that. <laughs> where in the world can you have an event like that? It just doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Right. It just doesn't. Right. And that, for me, that was just, that was the best. That that was, just those kinds of instances, and they just happened over and over and over and did it for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a big following. I mean, people love you. There's people making comments tonight that are, you know, they're just saying how lucky we were, blessed we were to have you so long. And uh, I always look forward to, to working with you. We We have some great memories. I mean, I didn't do it as long as you did. I did it for 15 years. And, uh, and then I got out basically in 2009 was my last sale. And, uh, I think my last POA was in 10 or 11, but, uh, yeah, we, we had some good memories, but like you say, it was something special. The POA is a unique looking horse or pony and the breed and the people are too. And you just kind of got adopted by them and, uh, you know, you fit right in there. So, well, this, um, um, you know, this is the longest continuous breed with an annual auction in America. Right. I think he told me it's been 65 years. That's, Nobody else. Right. No other breed has that. Right. It started in 57. Um, they didn't even have that many POAs when they started it. You know, they started the national show in 59. So they started selling them two years before they got together nationally yeah. to show them. And, uh, one of the things well, I, I got to go ahead, Doug. No, I, I, at one point I sat down and kind of put a pencil to it and I kept a lot of the catalogs, but I don't have them all. Lord, I'm just stunned by the amount of catalogs you have. <laughs> but I, I think that in my lifetime, I have probably sold at auction somewhere between 4,500 and 5,000 POAs. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. That, that's a lot. You can. I remember when the fifty thousand. I think the Kennedy family paid for the number fifty thousand. We had an auction. You probably auctioned it off. <laughs> to think uh, about I it, I may have. You may have, but uh, number fifty thousand, and you were doing the auction then. So you know that when you consider you auctioned that many, yeah, and it's that for numbers probably conservative. You probably auctioned more than that, but. One of the things I always respected about you is, and I've seen this at other events and stuff, that they didn't do it, but, you know, you wouldn't roll in Friday morning. Again, for people that don't realize about the sale, most of the time Doug did the sale. It was a Friday-Saturday deal. The futurity was big on Thursday. They would do some on Wednesday, and then Thursday was, a you know, bell-to-bell -bell show. And uh, But Doug wouldn't come rolling in Friday morning in his suit all ready to go. He'd be there Thursday easily, and you'd be sitting in the stands watching the show, and then you would use that when you were up on the block. You know, you'd remember right. the horses that you watched. you show, seen them in Pleasure or English or in Halter, and you'd say, I remember this baby. It was in the third row, and this little girl in a red shirt was showing her, and, you know, or what I can just remember. And uh, that just shows that you respected it. You weren't just there to collect a check and, and come, yeah, it, come at 8 o'clock, you know. No, and, you know, my associate with the POAs was never about a check. Right. Um, you know, some things, it's like I said, some things you do kind of for money and some things you kind of do for just cause you love it. Right. And this happened to be a situation where, uh, when I first started with the POAs, it was, it was my big break. It was having the door open and walking in and have an opportunity to show people whether or not you had the chops to do this kind of activity. Cause most people don't, most auctioneers, this is just not going to be a place where they're going to be successful. Right. And I had grown up going to horse auctions in Rushville, Indiana, and a few little spots around Ohio. But Rushville, Indiana was the place that I went the most and sat and watched those two old guys uh, <laughs> do that auction every Thursday. I mean, on Thanksgiving, it's a Thursday, <laughs> and there's an auction in Rushville, Indiana. It was the uh, oldest continuous horse auction west of the Allegheny. 
Wow. And I started going there when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And those guys were real folksy. Right. And they'd talk. And they'd let the guys ride the horses and take off the saddle and throw it off in the corner and jump on them and, you know, yahoo up and down the, the run because back there they run them up and down. They didn't have a ring where they just kind of walked them around. And uh, then when I went to auction school, I had the the luck, I guess you can call it, of having Gordy Hannigan be one of my instructors. And then I had the great luck of being a bid spotter for Gordy Hannigan at Tattersall's and at the Congress. And Gordy was folksy. Okay. Gordy talked to you. Right. Gordy's where I heard the line that he, he said one time, he said, you know, I used to be a quarter horse judge. He said, I was the best judge money could buy. <laughs> right. Everybody in the in the sale barn lost their mind, <laughs> and I used that line on Chuck Schroeder when Chuck was my uh, pedigree reader at a lot of the Ohio sales. Okay, and the first time I ever did it, Chuck just cringed <laughs> because he was a school teacher and a coach. He was probably the president of the Great Lakes Appalachian Association. He was a judge, and he was beyond reproach. Chuck was uh, the best guy in the world, and I said that at one of the Ohio sales, and Chuck looked at me and got all big-eyed, and I grinned at him. And he, he knew I was kidding, but uh, I loved using that line on, on Chuck Schroeder. And uh, that's just how Gordy was. And right. from watching him, and I think Gordy Hannigan was probably the best stock horse auctioneer I ever saw. Oh, that's and yeah. yeah. And and I and I realized the POA club goes over there to Gordyville now. Yep, they and, go to uh, Gordyville for the sale now. And yep. I I was around Gordy's kids and Miss Hannigan and of course I did the last few sales with uh, Gordy's nephew Gary, Gary and his son. Yeah. And uh, I just think Gordy was probably the the best auctioneer of that style of horses in America, ever. Right. And uh, I, I, I picked up a lot of that style from watching not only the guys in Rushville, but Gordy. And with the POAs, it worked because it's a family organization. Right. It is about the kids and the grandkids and mom and dad and the grandparents, and they're all going to have a conference, and, <laughs> oh, are we going to make the next bid on this one or not? And I'm asking them to give me $425. Right. It ain't like I'm asking for 25000 right? you know. Oh, and it, that was just as important to them as any of the others. And that's just, that's why I enjoyed it so much. I can always remember you, too, when the owners, they would have conferences, you know, and you'd say, can you stand it? Can you stand it? Yeah. You'd say that like three or four times. And that was basically like hitting the gavel down, but your voice had come across there. And you'd say it a few times because there was a rule. If you walked out, you know, it was basically like a no sale if they didn't say anything. And uh, they would finally nod to you, and then you'd yell sold, or I'd yell sold, or whoever. But, uh, yeah, well. Next pony going to a new zip code. The next pony going uh, to yeah, new hound in the hunt. And I, I grew up as a kid. New hound in the hunt. I know Tracy uh, was I, a, a young lady watching all that, too. She, We talk about that all the time, new hound. And one of the things I've never heard no one say but you is, this mare couldn't outrun a fat man in uh, silks or whatever. Velvet boots. Yeah, velvet boots. Fat man in velvet boots. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. yeah, or suede slippers, he said one time. Said, this right. mare couldn't outrun him. And I, I'm over there just spitting on the microphone. I'm laughing. And then all of a sudden you look at me like, okay, now you got to say something. And I'm yeah. choking. Yeah, now you talk about the pedigree. Yeah, you talk about the yeah. pedigree. You'd set me up sometimes. I'd be laughing. And then I'd have to, to go. But um, So you started in 85 at the national sale. And then uh, you had a few health issues in the early 90s, didn't you? Or one? or I did. Yeah. I did. I was uh, in early 92. Uh, in May of 92, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. Oh, man. And, uh, you know, we all scared to death. Hell, everybody is when <laughs> they tell you news like that. And I remember I had to have surgery on a Sunday morning, and Diana's scared to death, and I'm scared to death. And, and uh, you know, they've given me shots. And. I kind of looked at her just as they were getting ready to roll me into surgery, and I said, Di, this is all going to be okay. Uh, I just signed a 
three-year contract with Lynn Puffenbarger <laughs> to do the international sale, and I'm not going to let anyone else collect that money. <laughs> That's the last thing I told her before they rolled me into surgery. And uh, that contract that Lynn and I had, it was true. And after the, the previous sale in Tulsa, uh, we went over to the concession stand and wrote that three-year contract out on a paper napkin. <laughs> and we, napkin yeah. we both signed it, and that was it. <laughs> yep, that was legal. That was legal. To, yeah, oh, to there, leave. there, you're showing a picture. Yep, there's, there's Lynn uh, and, and you and Jim Campbell and Jan Jones yep. Nolan, the so three Oklahomans, yep. and yep. an Ohio guy, and that's a great picture there. And uh, that yep. was in Tulsa, of course. So well, and that was a, uh, uh, you know, that was a great. Uh, place to hold it. I was a great place to hold a sale, but, uh, and Tulsa was a great place to hold a sale. And, um, you know, when I got to go to all these different places around the country and, and do the sales, the committees had always set up a really great spot for us to do the auction. So right. it was a, I needed to get that hat shaped a little bit better. I could see, but <laughs> and I thought you used to help I, sell hats, didn't you? For your family, you were a hat. I did. Yeah. yeah, I was a hat. I needed to work on the brim on that one. Just well, that might bit. have been after a hundred head. Who knows? What well, you might have been well, pulling. It could have been. Pulling it on might it have been. Bit. Yeah, Jim Campbell was from uh, Jet, Oklahoma. You know, that's not far from where I'm at now. And then, of course, Lynn was in Cherokee, and that's fifty miles from where I'm sitting. And then uh, Jan's parents uh, art and rocky jones they raised some great caddo's poas and you you auctioned poas for all three of them but they were all hard working yeah. you know poa volunteers and lynn did you, a lot for poa you know yeah lynn lynn was a lynn, lynn was a great guy he, yeah. and and lynn when he'd ever bring one in the rain you, you kind of get to the money and some people would kind of want you to hang on and get another bid or two lynn was never that way Right. He'd say sell him. Sell him. He'd just say sell him. Yeah, he'd yeah. walk out. Yeah. He'd say sell it. Yeah, and yeah, that, sell him. That's one thing I'm proud about. I mean, I didn't consign that many over the years, but probably ten or twenty. But uh, I never no sale the POA at the national sale. My brother did. You know, he no sailed a few, but I I never no sailed one when I brought them in there. They sold, and you know, I was happy. Uh, I sold a full two full brothers one time. One went for. Twenty six hundred dollars, and you made a speech after it. You said it was the Crimson Kid. He went on to win the Leonard Lewis for charity and the McLaren for charity. And you said, "I got two bids on this horse." He said, "I've seen this done before, and they did it to Kent. They froze him out." He goes, <laughs> "Because one person started. You know, you started at five thousand wear or whatever, and then went down. Right. And somebody jumped at twenty five hundred. You were going to go all the way down to like five hundred, and then work your way up. And somebody bid while well, they." They just figured out something was going on, so only one person bid after that, and that was it. Two bids for the whole horse. <laughs> so, but then well, I, you, you never know what you you know you can't guess uh, how crowds going to respond. No. And uh, being an auctioneer is a, it's an unusual trade because you are conducting commerce in public, right? And you know it. You just don't know who's out there. And, uh, you know, I've been an auctioneer for 43 years, and I've got an auction this Saturday. I mostly do charity <laughs> events now. Okay. But you just don't know who's going to bid what or what someone's motivation is. Uh, it, it's, it's as much fun for me to watch uh, <laughs> as it is to be the auctioneer for it. Right. Right. Well, I moved a picture now to a mare named Crusaders Moon Dust, and this would have been yep. 2004, so pretty late in your uh, POA career. But uh, you and I had worked together probably nine or ten years by then. And uh, go ahead. You're a good storyteller. You tell the story of, of how this happened. This was the first pony on a Saturday morning. And uh, so we'd had a hard Friday. And I walked up on the stand. Kent was already there. And up behind the stand on that wall, they they used to put up the record sellers of in all these different categories. So I kind of walk up on the stand, and, and I'm facing away from the crowd with my back to the crowd. And Kent looks at me, and he says, Ronnie Dunn's here. And the first thing goes through my mind is, 
who's Ronnie Dunn? Because <laughs> it just didn't register with me. And I'm thinking it's uh, the president of the club or a trainer or somebody that's going to talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> and all I want to do is get started because Friday kind of wore me out. Right. So I, I, I looked at you and I go, who's Ronnie Dunn? <laughs> and you go, you know, Brooks and Dunn. I go, oh, that Ronnie Dunn. <laughs> that changed things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. So, I, so I, I asked you, I said, where is he? And you said, he's uh, kind of about 2 o'clock, halfway up, taller than everybody in the room, big shock of blonde hair. Yeah. So I turned around, and, and you kind of led me to, to where he was, and I go, uh huh, I got him. Yeah, got him. And uh, <laughs> so I asked Ken, I said, uh, why is he here? And Ken says, I think he wants to buy this first pony. I go, really? He said, yeah. I said, so I kind of looked at the pedigree and kind of looked at the pony and, you know, had a whale of a record. And so we got started, and there were actually three bidders on this pony, and, and it got pretty high pretty quick. And there was a lady out of, Arizona, sitting off to my left, kind of where the Utah people always sat, right. bidding on this pony. And there was a gal up high in the middle out of Minnesota bidding. And uh, Ronnie wasn't bidding, but the woman sitting to his right was with the Tennessee POA Club. And she was bidding on his behalf. And when we got to, I was at 17000 and Ronnie had been bidding in this lady out of Minnesota and the lady out of Arizona. And, and uh, when I looked at Ronnie and the bid was at 17000 the lady looked at Ronnie and I read her lips and she said, you're on your own. <laughs> well, Ronnie bid seventeen five. Someone else bids eighteen, uh, Or maybe the seventeen five he bid was, was what got it bought. Right. And maybe she said that to him at sixteen. Because I'm thinking he bid to me a couple of times. Right. So maybe at 16000 she said, you're on your own. <laughs> and uh, and he gave me 500 and someone else bumped him, and I came back to him, and, and uh, he bid the seventeen five. And at the time, that was the highest selling POA, I think, in history. Right. It's, it had beat the Colt record. We'll talk about him, too. But Doc's little baby had the record at 12, I think, 12 250 So, yeah, yeah, this beat it by over five grand. And, oh, it, yeah, yeah, beat it, beat it by a bunch. Yeah, I've smashed it. So, yeah, Tracy asked, how did I know? Because she said nobody knew he was there. Well, you know, I had my back against that brick wall, and I was staring out in the crowd, and I saw him walk. If you remember Des Moines and those steep stairs, and he, he come up those stairs just like it was an elevator. <laughs> he come, and he stood there for a minute because he was looking for his group. And I look at the guy, and I'm like, in his hair, he looked like he just got off the tour bus. You know, he was in blue jeans and a blue denim jacket, and his hair was kind of a mess. And, you know, but, yeah. but he looked, you know, I knew who he was, and I'm like, that's Ronnie Dunn. And I'm like, I better tell yeah. Doug. And you, we were shoulder yeah. to shoulder. I think they were yeah, presenting we were. some awards, like you say, or doing, you know, the high points or whatever, like they do on right. Saturday morning. Yeah. Right. And she was lot well, number 136. So that means you sold 135 ponies on Friday. The day before. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot yeah. of horses. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that weekend, maybe, maybe it was the next weekend, because this would have been a Saturday. But I think the next weekend... Ronnie and uh, Hitch Brooks hosted maybe a country music awards show or, or something, some big awards program that was on right. television. And I remember talking to him. Um, I might have had Gary Hannigan with me at that time because I went out in the barn and got him to autograph something for our daughter because okay. our daughter didn't believe I'd met Ronnie Dunn. And I said, as a matter of fact, I did. Yeah. And he autographed something that I gave to our daughter, Heather. So, uh, right. so yeah, it was a, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great memory. Great memory. Right. Yeah. That was a cool memory. I remember it like it was yesterday. So, uh, that was, I remember him walking out and you stuck out your hand and I'm like, man, I, he's on the wrong side. You know, I didn't get to stick my hand out, but he was going to the, the outdoor was on your side and the indoor was on my side. So, right. Yeah. 
Yep, that was a, a good memory. Then uh, let's see, I got a mare here, Doc's, or Doc's series. It's not a Doc Nemers, it's a different Midnight Miss. She sold for like 10000 the Zimmerman family from Florida. She sold another year. Uh, but then here's Pell Serenade. She's the one. In this book, it says 24, but I'm not sure if that's right. She might have sold for more than that, but somebody's got written 24000 uh, I'm, I'm not, oh. Uh, I was is, thinking is it this, was 25 or 26 is what she sold for. This uh, Is this the one that um, Tony Vincent yep. showed? Yep, that yeah, that Tony it and, was, uh, yeah. It was 25,000. Was it? Okay. Because um, I, watched, I watched this mare being shown, and then she came into the, the ring for me to sell her. And uh, I had seen Tony uh, riding this mare out in the ring. Uh, there next door to the sale pavilion, and uh, she was plenty fancy, right. plenty fancy. Yeah. And um, uh, I talked to him a little bit about you know where do you think she needs to be, and he gave me a ballpark. It wasn't anywhere near this kind of money. And uh, yeah, she brought twenty five thousand, and uh, I think a man out of Oklahoma. That's right. Yeah. This mare. yeah. She and, was a beautiful uh, mare too. She was well oh. bred too. Cody and the Santee Cody on the top and then Kiddo Tough on the bottom. So uh. I tell you what, and, and she moved, you know, the amazing thing about the POAs from the time I started being around them until 25 years later, the way they moved improved dramatically. Oh yeah. They, they, I did. mean, this, that mare, when I watched her in the rain, she could have went in the, in the show pen against anybody and held her own. Right. She was that good. Right. And a lot of them were that good. Right. They, and, uh, they just became little court horses or little Appaloosas. Yeah. And, and now yeah. people breed to own, own son, or not own sons, they breed to the famous horse now. And, and height is always an issue, but they, they master it pretty good. But, I mean, they're, if you pick up a court horse journal, a lot of the stallions that are in there are, are sires of POAs now. Uh, so when uh, when we sold that mare for twenty five thousand, I think Harry Chestnut was he used to stand just to the right of where I was on the auction stand. He said uh, that mare's going to uh, cost another twenty five thousand. I said, <laughs> "What do you mean?" He said, "The man that bought her for his daughter, that girl's a twin." I said, "Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, yeah, he, he's going to have to buy another one." Right? So, yeah, that was. That that's the highest selling POA I ever sold. Yeah, and that so, that's still the high selling POA ever that I know of. I think really, a gilding sold for in the teens since you stopped doing the sale, but I don't think it went over to the seventeen that the the mayor did or the twenty something that that mayor did. But there again, she smashed the other record you set. So uh, yeah, by a bunch. By a bunch. She, yeah. she smashed the record by seventy five hundred dollars. Oh, right. And I was yeah. on the block with you at both for both of those mares, and I knew they would both sell well. I didn't know they would sell that high, but I figured they'd both sell for maybe over ten, but not you know what they did. And uh, here I got a picture well, you know, now. Go ahead, Doug. Well, over the years, uh, having a, a horse like that sell for that kind of money was um, pretty significant, but it wasn't like it was unexpected, right? Because over from the time I started and until, and I don't know what year I sold that wing and coat for Doc Nimmers, but when I sold that wing and coat for 12000 that was a lot of money. But that kind of like it was breaking through a ceiling. And right. all of a sudden, POA people were like expecting them to bring significant money. Right. And, you know, that international sale. I had many people over the years at regional sales tell me the kind of money you get for POAs in Des Moines or Tulsa help us sell POAs back home the other 11 months of the year. Right. And, and that was meaningful to me because um, that sale kind of set the tone for what people out in the rest of America or even Canada were doing. Uh, and they'd look at it and say, well, Ed, you know, half-sister to this one sold for $8,000 in Des Moines back in October. So um, it, it helped elevate the industry uh, 
all the time. For sure. So I was, I was kind of proud of that. Well, right. Well, I remember you, you ended up getting all the records, you know, and Pokey Plotted had sold in 82 for 8,000, and that was one record. It took you a while to get, but you got it. But you broke took so a long, long time, long time to, to get that record. Yeah, so a long time. So you sold Avatar in eighty in eighty nine when it went back to Iowa, and he sold for eighty one. So he broke the high selling, you know, overall POI. But he was a stallion. So then you right. had he's still the high selling stallion. Well, then I got all the numbers in front of me here. Then it was in the sevens for about five years. The whole time it was in Tulsa, the high seller was around the sevens then 93 94 it went dipped a little bit the high seller to like 61 and 57 so you're right i mean it in 95 is when doc's colt sold doc's tough mister and he doubled the previous two years i mean at 12,250 that was twice what the high seller had brought the two years previous so yeah there were a lot of people uh with their mouths open when we <laughs> sold that colt for that kind of money yeah and then Doc brought in another Colt that went to Utah, I remember, in 98, Doc's Grand Design. And uh, Cecil Lofton bought him for seventy two fifty. He was the high seller at the sale, and he was is a he the one that Is he the one that ended up going over height? I think he probably did. He brought him back to a sale, and he didn't get a very good bid. Uh, but he was a tremendous baby, you know, and, and Linda... Uh, Schoenfeld had him conditioned great for Doc, you know, and he was bred great, of course. And, uh, you know, after that well, Colt sold, hardly the high seller hardly went under 9,000. I don't know if it did the rest of the time you sold. It was pretty much nine and above was the high seller after 98. So, well, and, and that, that uh, Colt I sold to Cecil Lofton that went to Utah. Right. Because by then I'd, I'd become friends with the, uh, the folks out of Utah, and they were great folks, and, and and still are great folks. And they brought me to Utah a number of times to do a sale for. Them. And uh, Cecil put that oversized, I think he was gelding by then, uh, in a sale out there in Utah. And I spoke so highly of the, that <laughs> gelding, you know how. And he was pretty. He was oh, just pretty. Yeah. I spoke so highly of him that I actually got to the kind of money that Cecil wanted for him and he no sell me. Oh, he wow. says, you know, he <laughs> says, he says, you're right. He does have a pretty <laughs> eye and a, and a good head and a nice little ear. And he's got that really good throat latch. And he, you know, his neck comes out of his chest in the right place and look at that hip. <laughs> <laughs> he was just mimicking everything you said. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I just think I'll keep him. <laughs> so, that's funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I love that kind of stuff. Right. I got the catalog page on here now of Doc's Tough Mister when he was consigned in, in 95. And unfortunately, you know, he passed away later that yeah. year. But, I mean, that wasn't, you know, that was no one's fault. The Colt just nope. passed away. But nope. uh, here's the color color photo of him, good picture of Doc and uh, Junior Reams who purchased him. So what a lot of people, I wrote a story about this because, you know, when he sold for so much money, there was a lot of naysayers for a while saying it w wasn't a real deal and this and that. And I didn't, I was there. I knew it was real. You know, you were there. Trust, you know it was real. Trust me, that was that was a real deal. <laughs> that was a real when deal. I sold him, when I sold him for that kind of money, there was somebody else ready to sign a check right behind that bid. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. That was, and I know that all was those a, people that were, you know, it was a group of people that was bidding on him was the contending bidder. And when Mr. Reams lost this colt, I do so much research, you know, and I have a good memory. He went and bred mares at Doc's place to the sire of this colt who was getting old by then. Doc's tough dude. You sold a lot <laughs> of dude colts over the years. Right. And uh, yeah. he... Uh, he actually got a loud leopard that he raised, and he named him Reams. I'm a Mister Two, in honor of Doc <laughs> Tuffman. And a lot of people don't know that, but Mister Reams liked loud colored leopards, and you know this. Well, he was loud, you know, and he was built good too and bred well. well but uh, and he was fit up. You know, I remember you said, because the one judge killed this colt, he didn't use him, and you said, he's in Canada by now. He said, he's crossed the border or something like that. Right. Because you always right. used to say, he got first under the good judge, you know, and That's stuff right. like that. Yeah. Right. The good judge used him really well. Yeah, the good tough. judge used him well. Yeah. 
I'm just flipping through some pictures here. I wanted to bring up Doc's other mare. You know, Doc did really well at the sale. Tell the story, if you would, about Doc when he, if you want to, about when Doc sold that colt. Oh, so, you know, I sold this colt in October, and it gets to be somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I get a, a like a Christmas card-sized envelope in the mail, and it was from Doc Nimmer. And it was a color picture of that colt in the selling in the ring. I'm on the stand. You're next to me. The colt's there. <laughs> and uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, Doc had written, thanks, Doug, and the price, $12,225 or whatever it was, right. two fifty dollars something yeah. like that. And uh, he included a little letter. <laughs> and he, after he got his money, him and his wife, went down in the Caribbean, maybe in the Bahamas or somewhere, had him a big vacation. Well, Doc said, I want to thank you for getting all that money. We took a vacation. I felt like that kid walking around with the T-shirt that said, uh, Mom and Dad went to Grand Canyon, and all I got was this T-shirt. Well, Doc went to the Bahamas, and all I got was this autographed picture you didn't even get a souvenir shot glass or anything no (laughs) no no but i tell you what that colt was famous because people in the quarter horse world and the appaloosa world and a lot of these other worlds i'd run into some of these folks and they'd say did you sell a wing wing and colt for twelve thousand two hundred and fifty dollars i said sure did And they couldn't believe it. A pony. That was, that was a pony big money. Cult too. Big oh, money. yeah, big money. Yeah. Well, it was the yeah, right place at the right time. He was fitted up really good. And I remember the contending bidder had told me, like in August, she said, I'm going to buy that colt. And Doc consigned him into the sale, and I'm going to buy him, which she didn't end up buying him. But, you know, she thought he'd she probably tried. go for five or six. Yeah, she thought he was going to go yeah. for five she or tried. six. She tried, right. yeah. She chipped a tooth uh, eating popcorn during that deal because she got so excited. <laughs> so, I got a picture now of another one Doc consigned. It wasn't as flashy as that one, but she went on to do a lot in POAs. She's got sons out there and stuff. That's that few spot mare that sold for 10000 I think that was an evening sale i know it was it was dark outside when she went through the ring a uh, lot 151 doc scotch and zip and uh, she was doc's raised so many great ones over the years and uh, you know one thing well, look at the, look at the pedigree on this on right this, uh, an own granddaughter of zippo pine bar you got zippo appeal. pine bar and scotch bar made i mean excuse me <laughs> and i don't know who's on the damn side but uh, uh you know that's just those are just well-bred animals right Right, for sure. And Doc did that. You know, he, he bred a lot of great POAs, the POAs, but then he went out and he took shots and he bred to, uh, you know, Chocolate, he's a famous Appaloosa now, and he's really famous in POAs. And the first man to breed to him in POAs, Doc Nemers. He bred yeah. to him at least once, and he was the very first. And, and now there's he's one of the leading sires of all times, and uh, he's more famous in POAs than he is in apps. But he, I think he won, like, the Tom Powers and some big futurities when he was young. He beat the quarter horses, so that's how he got famous. Well, i tell you, back, uh, back in the day when I was doing the international auction, the POA international auction was doing things at an auction sale that the Appaloosa breed could not do. Right. They never had a they never had an auction that rivaled what was happening at that POA international sale. They just didn't. And I had friends that were uh, in the Appaloosa business. You know, Larry Edwards lived just on the north side of Dayton. He was a very famous Appaloosa person. And there were a lot of other people I knew who, you know, were into apps and, you know, we had the store and we right. did business with people with all kinds of breeds, and the Appaloosa just simply couldn't do uh, what the POAs were doing. Right, right. Since we're talking about Ohio, I, I would uh, feel bad if I didn't mention a great uh, ring person for years and years for you, and he's from Ohio. He's passed away now, but uh, the late Charlie Bropes. And, uh, Charlie Brooks was the best. He was a good man, and he was a friend of mine. He used to call me in the winter. He'd start getting a little depressed or something when he was older, and I'd give him a call, or he'd give me a call, and we'd talk for two hours about POAs, and, you know, time would just fly. And uh, he worked hard as a ring person for years and years uh, at the sale. 
And I had Charlie a picture of him. I don't know if I have it on here, but I, I had a picture queued up, but I can't find it now. But Well, Charlie was up there around Grove Point, Ohio. Grove Port, I think it was. Right. Around Columbus. And uh, we worked the Ohio sales. And uh, at the first auction I did in Indianapolis, uh, Charlie was kind of out in the middle catching bids. And I was on a break. Chris Woods was uh, selling. And Charlie went back to his bidder to bid again, and, and they didn't bid. And I kind of stepped in to ask the people to bid, and I can't remember whether they did or whether they didn't, but mm -hmm. Charlie kind of took me aside, and he said, you need to respect bid spotters <laughs> as the professionals that we are. And he kind of chastised me a little bit. Right. And it's it's a lesson that I never forgot. And Charlie and I did auctions in Ohio. We did foundation quarter horse auctions. Uh, we did, of course, the POA auctions. Um, wow. The miniature horse people hired me to do a couple auctions for them. And the first guy I'd call, because they'd say, hire whatever <laughs> right. uh, bid spotters you want or ring them. I, Charlie Brooks was first call. He was a great person. Just Very a, professional. Just a yeah. great person. Oh, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Well, Doug, this has been a great time. I'm glad you could join us tonight. And uh, I know people are loving it. There's a lot of comments. And uh, we have 394 hearts, so I don't know how many of those are Tracy's. But that means somebody was punching the heart <laughs> button. So uh, that's probably a record. Tracy well, said this is the best show ever. Last week I did, well, it was two weeks ago, I did a show about my family. I just waited till 19 to do it. And, uh and she said that was the best show ever. Well, tonight she come on here and said, now this is the greatest show ever. So, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so kind. Um, I have so many fond memories of people all over America that I got the opportunity to meet in this picture you're showing now with KS is right. talking about that's the steel family and the pals is talking about bunny Kennedy and her family. And of course, Olin Ziegler and, and all the great people in Ohio and Indiana and just right. all over the country that had I not gotten the opportunity to be around POAs, uh, I'd never met these people. Right. And, uh, boy, my life, uh, has certainly been enriched by all those, uh, friendships I made, all the places I got to run around the country and, and see and do auctions. It was, uh, uh, I got more out of it than the other folks did. <laughs> Trust me, if they're sending you hearts, I'm, I feel exactly the same way. Oh, good. It was, a, it was a love affair that still exists. All right. Well, uh, thank glad. you so much for inviting me to be a oh, part Oh, well, you won't be forgotten in POAs, and I'm one of the people that'll make sure you won't as long as I'm talking about history. So uh, I don't want to say your history, but <laughs> you were a big part of the POAs. So. Uh, and you're in the Hall of Fame too, so that's an honor. I so, am, yeah. And that's yeah. Um, I was uh, I was humbled by that when it happened, and I'm still humbled by it. Right. Well, when you can go into a breed that you know, I don't know if you ever owned a POA, but all the work you did for POAs was enough. You know what I mean? And it was deservingly so. So, because uh, well, we all know you worked more than just like a paycheck, like you said, more than a paycheck. So. Right, yeah. right. All right, Doug. Thank well, you, my friend. Uh, you have a good time it. in Miamisburg. I always watch the, uh, what do you call it there, the the big place. Uh, oh, you know that you've you've worked on. Uh, the Plaza Theater. The Plaza Theater, yep. I follow that yeah. on Facebook. And the yeah. murals, the murals in Miamisburg. So. Right, uh, right. Well, I sold the car you know, the other uh, day to some people. It was a young couple. They're in Enid because of the military. And I said, where are you guys from? And they said, uh, Ohio. And I said, uh, okay, what town in Ohio? And they go, Dayton. And I said, oh, I'm going to be interviewing a gentleman from Miamisburg. And they both smiled. They're like, well, that's right by Dayton. <laughs> so they, they yeah, knew Miamisburg. Right. Right. We're just south of Dayton. And, you know, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't let everybody know that, that who's sitting on the stand to my left doing the pedigrees is so very, very vital to the success of what I'm trying to do as an auctioneer. And, and I work with some really great people 
that really took what they were doing seriously, but nobody, I mean nobody, knows as much about POAs or put as much effort and work into it as you did, my friend. Well, you were thanks, definitely the best. That, that means a lot to me. I really enjoyed all those years working with you, so uh, it was always a pleasure. So. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll get to do it again someday somewhere. <laughs> maybe. If you ever need a pedigree reader, call me up. I'm in Enid, Oklahoma. So, If you ever need an auctioneer, call me. <laughs> okay, I'm Doug. in Miamisburg, Ohio. <laughs> All right. Okay, Doug, I'm going to let you go, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more and sign off. So thanks again so much for doing this. It was a, an honor and a pleasure. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Yep, bye. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. That was Doug Sorrell from Miamisburg, Ohio. He started uh, the, doing the international sale in 1985 and did it for 25 years. And uh, he broke all the records eventually, and uh, most of those records are still standing, if not all of them. Like he said, some of them were very tough to get. Pokey Plotit's record was uh, hard to get. Uh, he broke the, the overall record a few years after he started with Hive Avatar, but that mare record. But ironically, he ended up breaking that record probably three or four times because Doc's white mare and then uh, the mare Ronnie Dunn purchased and, of course, the Pal Serenade mare, they all uh, went over $10,000 and broke the $8,000 record of Pokey Plotted. So, so it was a, a good uh, talk with Doug. I enjoyed all the years working with him. Uh, he's one of the reasons I did become an auctioneer. I wanted to as a kid, but, you know, my guidance counselor in school is like a horse auctioneer. You know, you need to go to regular college. So I played football in college for a while and studied history and other things. And I was uh, probably, what was I, 41 when I attended Missouri Auction College in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, I, I still uh, love auctioneering and stuff, and Doug's one of the big reasons for it. So uh, POAs is good that they were able to have him as long as we have with POAs and I want to thank everybody for watching I hope you enjoyed all these pictures I just uh, randomly went through some of these I had hundred and fifty some pictures tonight some of them I didn't explain but uh, they're write-ups from the book so you could read them while Doug and I was chatting uh, here's an Ohio bred right here that's in Edmond Oklahoma now and uh, I think I went through a lot of these pictures ultimate bounce sold as a baby and and there's the high selling mare again. But there's just been so many famous uh, POAs go through the sale and uh, and break records and make kids happy. You know, and there uh, there's POAs that sold for four hundred dollars. I have the clipping in here of Rough and Tough. Doc didn't even have a picture of him, uh, but he sold for eight hundred and I think twenty five dollars in nineteen eighty nine. And if I can, I might be getting to it here. There we go. I'm glad I got to this because here's Rough and Tough sales ad, no picture, and this was Kiddo's second baby born. The Crisco Kid was first and Rough and Tough was second. And read the bottom line of the owner's statement. This was written by Dr. Julian Nemers, and it says, Sire is young but will become famous soon with foals like this one. Well, <laughs> Kiddo Tough became a Hall of Famer, a legend, leading sire for years and years. He's still second to his own grandson, the Silver Kid. And, of course, Rough and Tough's in the top 20 of all times as a sire and a two-time grand champion for the Damon family. And, uh, you know, so they don't always sell for records, but, you know, this horse is worth his weight in gold, and he's still alive at 32 years old, and he's still in uh, Melbourne, Iowa with the Damon family. Uh, so, you know, them are special memories, too. I want to thank everybody for watching. Again, uh, Tracy, for... Uh, chiming in all so much she's a great historian as well everybody else that uh watched uh, we have 517 hearts now so doug thanks for uh being on here you got me a lot of hearts i think i probably is now five five eighteen so uh tell all your friends and family i know there's thousands of people that were connected with the sales over the years uh and uh, just tell them that this show is on the POA History Group and that they just have to join if they're not. It's real easy to join, and they can go on and watch this show anytime on Facebook, and uh, they'll enjoy the, all the stories with Doug and all the pictures. So, again, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, next week, I'll let you know what the topic's going to be. I haven't decided yet. Probably be about a, a famous POA breeder, maybe one out in Utah. So, um, enjoy the song. Thanks for watching, everyone.